everybody, welcome to Back to Space. This week we're going to be talking about something super fun. We're going to be talking about the history of the spacesuit. This is a fun story and I learned a lot while researching. So it started way back in 1934. What a great year. With a pilot named Wiley Post. Now good old Wiley was the first pilot to fly solo around the world. He wanted to fly faster so he went higher. And at 50,000 feet in the air, something happens. The air thins. And you know what? He had to figure out how he was going to pressurize the cabin so he could, you know, live. He went to work with this other guy named Russell S. Colley. He was a US mechanical engineer who played a role in developing what would become the one, the only, first practical pressure suit. Colley designed these suits using his wife's sewing machine. The pressure suit had three layers. The innermost was basically long underwear. The middle layer was rubberized air pressure bladder and the outer layer was made of rubberized parachute fabric. And guess what? The outfit was complete by pigskin gloves, rubber boots, aluminum, and plastic diver's helmet. The helmet had a removable faceplate that could be sealed at a height of 17,000 feet and could accommodate earphones and a throat mic. They ended up being successful and then Post tried the suit on September 5th, 1935 and reached, eventually, an altitude of 47,000 feet with success. After all that nonsense, it's not nonsense, I just love saying nonsense. Anywho, in the 1940s, Collie started to help design the Goodrich XH5 full pressurized suit. He was inspired by segments of a tomato worm. I mean, that spacesuit here looks a lot like that worm. The knees, hips, and elbows were made with segmented joints, which it allowed for flexibility lacking in earlier designs. So good job, Kali. That's when he and his collaborators were awarded a patent in 1946. So then this is where Russia comes in. The first spacesuit was technically made for Yuri Gagarin, flying the maiden voyage of the Vostok 1 spacecraft. This suit provided full pressure and an auxiliary life support system. Then he landed and people were like, oh my god, what is that? Gagarin later recalled, and I quote, when they saw me in my spacesuit and the parachute dragging alongside as I walked, they started to back away in fear. I told them, don't be afraid, I'm a Soviet like you who has descended from space and I must find a telephone to call Moscow. What a story. Now we're going back to America. America entered the space race. NASA was like, hold up guys, we need protection from sudden depressurization of the spacecraft cabin, which is like kind of super important. So they reached out to BF Goodrick company and our guy Collie came to the rescue again. The suits he made were modified versions of the Navy Mark IV pressure suits. Here are the changes from the Navy Mark IV suit and the Mercury suit. Replacement of the open loop breathing system with a closed loop system, eliminating the rubber diaphragm around the wearer's face. Oxygen entered the suit through a hose connected at the wearer's waist, circulated through the suit to provide cooling, and exited through the hose on the right of the helmet or through the face opening, depending on whether the faceplate was open or closed. A small pressure bottle connected by a small hose to a connector next to the astronaut's left jaw was used to pressurize the pneumatic seal when the faceplate was closed. Replacements of the dark gray nylon outer shell with one made of aluminum coated nylon for thermal control purposes. Replacement of the black leather safety boots for the ones made first from white coated leather, later aluminized nylon coated leather, again for thermal control. Introduction of straps and zippers to provide a snug fit, along with refinements in the shoulder, elbow, and knee retaining cords, special gloves with fork, curved fingers for grasping the controls with the middle finger made straight for pushing buttons and flipping toggle switches, a biomed flap on the right thigh for the connection of biomedical connections to the spacecraft's telemetry systems. All six original Mercury astronauts were fitted by Kali for their suits. These suits had an inner layer of neoprene coated nylon and a distinctive aluminized nylon outer layer originally meant to protect pilots against ultraviolet and thermal radiation. This was would become a staple for sci-fi films and novels for the rest of time. So now America's like, we don't just want to go to space, we want to go to the moon. Hence, obviously, the Apollo and Skylab space suits, aka the A7Ls, were made. These were defined as EMUs, extravehicular mobility units. 
Okay. The EMU consisted of a suit and a backpack, but because it's NASA, they need to make some acronyms. So the suit is actually the pressurized suit assembly, the PSA, and the backpack is the portable life support system, PLSS. They were planning on getting the hell out of the ship and going to the moon. Gah, how much pressure if the suit didn't work? Get it? How much pressure? Because they needed a pressurized suit? Ha! Okay, but seriously, that's a lot of trust and they must have had a lot of faith in the engineers that created it. So basically, this EMU took over three whole years to produce. Between 1962 and 1964, the spacesuits were deemed the very interesting name of, and I quote, the space suit assembly. Come on, it could have been cool, like the alien skin, the attempt to survive, but nah, just the space suit assembly. So the A7L pressure suit first reached spaceflight on October 1968 on board Apollo 7, and they were used as launch and re-entry emergency suits. The complete Apollo EMU, the whole kit and caboodle, made its debut with Apollo 9. Then Apollo 11 made the A7L the most famous and iconic suit of the entire program. Actually, Neil Armstrong described his suit as tough, reliable, and almost cuddly. That's an odd description, but I'm into it. It ended up becoming the primary pressure suit worn by NASA astronauts for the entirety of the Apollo program. So I'm showing you here, I'm gonna talk you through it. This basic design of the A7L suit was the one piece, five layer torso limb, weird, suit with convoluted joints made with synthetic and natural rubber at shoulders, elbows, and wrists, hips, ankles, and knee joints. A shoulder cable conduit assembly allowed the suit's shoulder to move forward, backwards, up, or down with user's movements. Quick disconnections at the neck and forearm allowed the connection of the pressure gloves and the famous Apollo fishbowl helmet, adopted by NASA as it allowed an unrestricted view as well as eliminating the need for visor seal required in the Mercury and Gemini and Apollo Block 1 spacesuit helmet. A covered layer, which was designed to be fire proof after the deadly Apollo 1 fire was attached to the pressure garment assembly and was removed for repairs and inspection. All A7L suits feature a vertical zipper from the helmet disconnect, neck, ring, down the back and around the crotch. So this was used from Apollo 7 to Apollo 14. Then we're moving on to Apollo 15 to 17, Skylab and ASTP spacesuits. For the last three missions, the spacesuit were extensively revised. Now they call the A7LB because they couldn't think of anything better. That came in two versions. The EV extra vehicular version was a new mid-entry suit that allowed greater mobility and easier operations with the lunar rover. And they were designed for longer duration J series missions. The new suit incorporated two new joints at the neck and waist, and the waist joint was added to allow the astronauts to sit on the LRV, and the neck joint was to provide additional visibility while driving the LRV. You always want to know where you're going, people. In the moon, on Earth, on Mars, it's important. Because of the waist joint, the six life support connectors were rearranged from parallel patterns to a set of two triangles, and the up and down back zipper was revised and relocated. The zipper is actually a misnomer in that the A7L entry was through the two zippers sewn over each other. The inner zipper had rubber teeth and provided sealing. The outer externally visible zipper was a conventional metal tooth slider for a mechanical restraint. The A7LB had two pairs of such slippers, not slippers, zippers set that intersected on the right of the suit above the waist joint, opening at the suit required and doing a class that held the zippers set together. This sounds like a lot of work. Let's move on to the shuttle. They used a suit called the Space Shuttle Extravehicular Mobility Unit. Same name, just put Space Shuttle in front of it. This was developed in 1982 and is different because of its semi-rigid two-piece suit consisting of hard upper torso section with a primary life support electrical system and Apollo style bubble helmet on a soft lower piece that covers the astronaut's waist and legs. So this outfit provides support for 8.5 hours with 30 minutes of reserve and requires astronauts to pre-breathe for 45 minutes to adjust to the 100% oxygen. And before they get into that cute outfit, they have to put something even cuter on, a maximum absorbent garment. 
which is essentially a nice version of saying they're putting on Depends. Then it gets really crazy when in 1984, NASA tested the manned maneuvering unit, a jetpack-like device that was the first to fly under its own power completely separate from a spacecraft. Employed on the three missions, it was utilized to repair several satellites. The backpack is designed to wear over standard extravehicular mobility unit. It has 24 thrusters at various positions that expel nitrogen, allowing an astronaut to fly with precision around the space shuttle cargo bay or two nearby payloads and structures. After the 1986 Challenger disaster, use of the manned maneuvering unit was discontinued on safety grounds. Let's talk about the future. Check this out. This is called the XMU EMU. This is for the astronauts exploring the lunar surface, specifically at the moon's south pole. Although it looks very similar to the space shuttle suits, there are a lot of changes. For one, mobility. It allows you to actually moonwalk, not the Michael Jackson type. For instance, the original suit used for moon-based activities actually only offered enough range of motion for Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to be able to essentially bunny hop on the lunar surface. Sounds like a great time. This new design allows them to move around more dynamically, including actually walking, always important, and offers plenty of range of motion for their arms, combined with new gloves that actually allow astronauts to freely move their fingers. They can do things like pick up rocks off the lunar surface with relative ease. They can play, what is this? This is called patty cake. It's also designed to work with every type of body type. Many times spacesuits haven't fit women correctly or uncomfortably. This new design has inclusive sizing that can accommodate anyone from the first percentile female to the 99th percentile male. Also, Artemis is focusing on setting up shop on the moon, so the XEMU suit is designed to survive temperature ranges from between negative 250 degrees to positive 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This other nice suit is for the future as well. It's called the Orion Crew Survival Suit. It is a much, much lighter suit. It is designed to be worn during the takeoff and landing. The Orion suit, sometimes called a flight suit or launch and entry suit, has been enhanced from head to toe with improvements to the suit worn on shuttle missions. Starting at the top, a number of features on the helmet allow for improved comfort and function. The helmet is lighter, stronger, comes in more than one size, feel like that's important, helps reduce noise, important when you know, you're know you launching off of a rocket, and it's easier to connect with, to the communication systems needed to talk to other crew members and mission control. The outer cover layer, which is orange to make crew members easily recognizable in the ocean, which I thought was a very interesting fact, if they should ever need to exit Orion without the assistance of recovery personnel, includes shoulder enhancements for better reach and is fire resistance. The suit is a pressurized garment that includes a restraint layer to control the shape and ease astro of astronauts' movements. A re-engineering zipper, man, they're just redoing this zipper a million times, also allows astronauts to quickly put the suit on and has increased strength. New adaptable interfaces supply air and remove exhaled carbon dioxide. The suit has an improved thermal management that will help keep astronauts cool and dry. A liquid cooling garment is worn underneath the suit, a bit like thermal underwear, with embedding cooling tubes, was revamped to be more breathable and easier to build. Ah, so exciting. So that's where we are now. And of course, Virgin just recently released their commercial flight gear for space tourism. So now that we're taking a closer look at all the suits, you really do have to hand it to the Russell Collie. He was so inventive, built the foundation of many other spacesuits that are still being designed today. And to bat, it came off of a, a worm, tomato worm. So I think the lesson here, guys, is we should be in nature more and looking at worms. That's all I have for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed learning more about spacesuit fashion because who doesn't we lay up at night wondering, what am I gonna wear to space? <laughs> Anyways, I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. I will see you next Monday. Ow. <laughs> Thanks guys for tuning in. I appreciate it. If you liked this video, please give us a like, give us a share, give us a subscribe, subscription, give us a subscribed, I don't know. And uh, we'll see you next week. Leave a comment. This was uh, not what someone suggested, but if you wanna know some random thing about space, let me know.